Hi, I see there's no lectern. <laughs> I'm going to be my own lectern. It's great to be here back in my alma mater. I was a student in the honors program under Lawrence Wheeler and Michael Reardon, and my advisors David Johnson and David Horowitz. Without them, I would be just another college dropout with no prospects and no ability to identify the internal narrative frame of the Odyssey. <laughs> Something that often comes up at most cocktail parties. <laughs> My time here was hectic. I had three children under 11. I was drawing six cartoons a week for the Oregonian and was in the early, nearly fatal stages of my midlife crisis. I studied in my garage at one in the morning, did Spanish flashcards while riding in a 1998 Chrysler minivan, and memorized New Deal cabinet members while trying hard to recall just what precisely the meaning of the Peloponnesian War was. I'm not even sure I spelled Peloponnesian correctly, but I know the Thucydides did. I was also captain of the 2000 Portland State College Bowl team, which was my last official college road trip. It was the only road trip where I cautioned my 20 years, my junior teammates, they should not stay out all night drinking. <laughs> they did, and I went to bed at 10. We came in third in the tournament with hungover teammates when I managed to recall what the new area code of the Kennedy Space Center was. Can you guess it, anybody? What would it be? Three, two, one. That's how good PSU is. We can win drunk, sleepless, and hungover. <laughs> Today, however, I would like to talk to you about my profession, editorial cartooning, and the effect that the Charlie Hebdo massacre has had on not only US cartoonists, but cartoonists around the globe. As the president of the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists, I woke up to a text from a colleague telling me that the gunman had burst into the French newspaper Charlie Hebdo and murdered four cartoonists along with many other editors. This, had, had been, this was a signal moment in our lives because while we had been threatened by terror, most recently by the Norwegian newspaper Silly and Needlessly Juvenile Dra Muhammad Contest, we as a group had never been murdered for our work in the United States or in Europe. Many cartoonists had to go into hiding because of their participation in this newspaper contest, but no one died. Nor has any American columnist been murdered, nor has any American radio talk show host been murdered since Allen Berg in Denver in the 1970s, nor has any American television commentator been murdered, nor did I ever get up on any given morning in my now 37-year career and think that someone would try to kill me for an idea. Certainly I've been vaguely to specifically threatened, notably by those who think that all Americans should be armed with military-style assault weapons. These NRA threats have been ongoing, not only with me, but with virtually all political cartoonists. And is there a metal detector here? Did everybody go through the metal detection? <laughs> Good. Well, it's a college campus, you know. Um, these NRA threats have been ongoing, not only with me, but with virtually all political cartoonists who would take them on with their puny pens and brushes loaded with deadly ink. You see, brush and ink is dangerous. Brush and ink can destroy a silly idea, or even a dangerous one. So can Microsoft Word. So too can a humble legal pad. But if you put these things on paper, they do even more damage. If you show them to millions of readers, now you have a real weapon, the weapon of sensible thought, the weapon of the good idea. Now granted, there are many people expressing many ideas each day. We all take for granted that in American society, we all have the freedom and the right is guaranteed under the US Constitution to express our opinions in conversation, in speeches, on the air, in print, and on the internet. The free expression of ideas comes naturally to us as breathing. We have water coolers, bars, living rooms, coffee shops, and myriad other venues in which to express those ideas. Cartoonists have newsprint. They have the internet. And they can say virtually anything they want. So can the aforementioned columnists. So can the aforementioned radio and television host. And so can you. But the cartoonists of Charlie Hebdo were not in the United States. Most cartoonists do not live in the United States, and hence most cartoonists are not protected by the First Amendment. Free expression is a precious commodity. It's the water that ide allows ideas to grow. So when the cartoonists of Charlie Hebdo 
died in their offices, drawing cartoons, were shot in the head and shot in the back, the world took notice. The world reacted with revulsion. While many would note that the content of some of those opinions, the cartoons were indeed not what we or I would express, most people were shocked and revolted by these sick and senseless attacks. A million people marched in Paris to protest. Leaders from all over the world walked in the streets, along with countless others who followed them in silent tribute to the cold-blooded cold -blooded assassination of ideas. Oddly, the President of the United States chose not to attend. I'm not sure why to this day, but I wrote the President's press secretary as the president of our group and told him it was important as the leader of the free world and the capital of freedom of expression that she, he should have attended, as did most other Western leaders. Of course, I'm just a cartoon president. But I also know that America has a 225-year tradition of unfettered satire. The most recent challenge to American editorial cartooning came in the form of the Larry Flint case. Hustler magazine, that bastion of free expression, had published a parody of Jerry Falwell's mother having sex with him in an outhouse. Perhaps there's no more odious imagery. And in the case of Charlie Hebdo, there were many dreadful anti-Muslim cartoons that no sane or responsible US cartoonist or any other cartoonist would ever, ever draw. In the Flint case, this went to the US Supreme Court. And oddly, do you know who the writer of this majority opinion was? That avatar of progressive thought, Justice Antonin Scalia. Justice Scalia noted that back in the days of George Washington, the US had a strong history of satire, no matter how vile, how ill-informed, or how idiotic. And that key point was that satire was meant to push the boundaries. While I disagree with Justice Scalia on many things, one thing I will always respect him for is his insistence on the absolute right of free expression. Charlie Hebdo splashed over to this country with a vengeance. This past September, as president of the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists, I was faced with a sobering moment. We asked for the Department of Homeland Security to provide security for a bunch of cartoonists. The event was in Columbus, Ohio, a bastion of American Gothic normalcy, save Buckeye fever, a debilitating illness. The day of the Charlie Hebdo panel, we had a SWAT team, a bomb sniffing dog, a bomb disposal vehicle, multiple Franklin County deputy sheriffs, Columbus police, both uniformed and plain clothes. The plain clothes officers were in the bars with me at all times, <laughs> and us. <laughs> and they don't really drink, I had Diet Coke. One was always looking at me to make sure that things, that I thought things were okay, and he was always doing this. <laughs> Cartoonists in a bar in Columbus, Ohio, protected by police and SWAT teams and bomb-sniffing dogs. When we went to bed, uniformed Columbus police were at the doors. We emerged from our convention unscathed and there were no threats made against our group. In France last month, a large group of US and international cartoonists met. They were accompanied everywhere by all sorts of French police, and when they traveled, they were all in police motorcades. I think that one cartoonist told me that there were 13 police vehicles involved when their bus went somewhere. I saw many phone videos of these trips posted on Facebook. A few months after the Hebdo attacks, a right-wing loon held an anti-Muhammad art contest in Garland, Texas. 30 police were there when Muslim terrorists tried to shoot their way into the exhibit. These are, these are people who lived in the United States. The gunmen were killed, and I noted no good guy outside of a uniform with a gun managed to kill them, even in Texas. This was a needlessly inflammatory and shamelessly provocative contest, but they were within their rights to do this. All the cartoonists I know had their stomachs turn at the sight of the so-called satire, but we, were, we supported their right to do it. Gary Trudeau gave a speech a few months ago where he noted that the Hebdo cartoons were juvenile and that he, of course, would never do them. Of course he wouldn't, and I don't know any person, anyone personally who would. He missed the point. The point is that not that they were tasteless, they were. The point is that it was permissible to be tasteless and an artist should not be murdered in his or her own office, his or her own office for tastelessness or offensiveness. I have noted, interestingly, that the right in this country has been rather more supportive of freedom of satire than the left. This is a curious moment for any progressive cartoonist. 
A debate still rages in the United States and American political cartooning about the meaning of Je suis Charlie. Some cartoonists are repelled by having to align themselves with Hebdo cartooning as I am repelled by Larry Flint's sixth version of satire. But Scalia had it right. We can sort out hate speech by having debate and not censorship. This debate is also taking place, as it always has on college campuses. But the only really dangerous and violent speech I hear on campus is in the faculty senate. <laughs> the rest seems tame. I do not support hate speech. No one I know does. And, I, and hate speech is pretty clear to me. But if we let politicians decide what hate speech is, the boundaries will inexorably shrink. We must be vigilant always in our right to say what we think. Newspapers may make the legitimate judgment about publication. The internet is a speech free fire zone, but I am confident that the vast majority of Americans will exercise good judgment. One satirist's opinion about what constitutes the limit of expression may vary from that of another, but when we have politicians deciding, we have trouble. The First Amendment must remain immutable. The only thing that defends us from stupid speech is smart speech. Let me finally remind you that it wasn't just Charlie Hebdo cartoonists who were killed. All over the world, dozens of political cartoonists have been murdered or have disappeared or have been beaten or have been threatened. It is always, always a dangerous world for cartoonists and satirists. We don't hear much about them in this country because they are not Kardashians. They are not Trumps, but believe me, it is far more important subject, they are a far more important subject than these narcissistic media meme generating gas bags. <laughs> but I, didn't, I did bring Don Trump's hair with me today, which is. <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me back to my alma mater. Good luck to you all. Je suis Charlie, and more importantly, je suis Viking. Thank you. Thank you.